Today's coach and former Paralympian, Nathan Stevens. Today, um, Nathan, I'm not going to say too much yet, but um, this is a video. We're doing a video series called Coach on the Couch. Um, but you kind of fall into two categories of being a coach and an athlete, which is fantastic for me. Um, do you want to just tell everybody a bit, uh, just a little bit about yourself? Because I told you I've done my homework and you're in for it today. So can you just yeah, can, can, you, yeah, can, can you just tell me right first? Yeah, yeah. Well, Wikipedia, it's an awesome place. <laughs> Go ahead. Do, do you want to just introduce yourself? Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Obviously, I'm Nathan Steven, uh, Stevens, um, three-time Paralympian, um, winter and summer, and also Commonwealth Games athlete uh, from as you can see behind me, also 2018. Um, and now work for Disability Sport Wales as one of their senior performance athlete officers. Um, so. I, like I said, Nate, I've done my homework and, I, and I'm fortunate to have you um, as a friend and, and I've watched you coach and I love your, your coaching philosophy, the way that you come across to the athletes. Um, you began your journey um, around the age of nine, if I've got my, my, my bits and bobs right. Uh, do you want to tell people how your disability came about and what your disability yeah, is? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, so I lost my legs on my ninth birthday and stupidly tried... Uh, jumping on a slow moving freight train, uh, which didn't end so well. Um, that's resulted in me losing both my legs, my right side below the knee, and my left side uh, through my hip. Um, so, bilateral leg amputee. Um, and then from there, uh, it all kind of started, I guess. Um, obviously, I went, whilst I was in hospital, I was extremely low, extremely down. Um, I was mad into my rugby and football um, and, and wanted to become as, as any, you know. Welsh, Welsh young lad wants to be wants to play rugby for Wales or football, and and that dream kind of got shattered from from, from that moment on. Um, but I was extremely lucky to have a young lad come into hospital um, and, and talk to me who lost his legs through meningitis around a similar age, um, and got me involved in in ice sledge hockey, which was the first sport that I got involved in. And from that moment on, my passion for sport and physical activity just, just went to the roof and, um, yeah, didn't really look back. So, uh, that, that, that's how I really got into, got into sport. And that's crazy, really, because uh, I've read your story. I've, I've spoken to you about your story, uh, which is an amazing journey. And for many people, uh, they would say, what a tragic accident. But really, for you, in many ways, it's been totally different, hasn't it? It, is, yeah. it? it has totally changed your life. It, it, it's made me into the person I am today, uh, massively. Um, made me have a whole new look at life and what's important and, and just that resilient side of things that, you know, sometimes you're going to have your really rubbish days, and, but there's always going to be a brighter side to it. You just need to try and put yourself in that mental space to be able to think of, of the more positive side of things and when I look back on my accident now I, I wouldn't well the only thing I would change is obviously the the, the feelings that um and the stress and pressure that I put on my family that that, that would be the only thing that I would change right now but you know I, I've led an amazing life since since April the 11th 1997 and wouldn't really look back and and, and change anything so You've told every, everybody your birthday. I actually had that down as one of my key facts. You beat, you beat me to it. Ah, 32 years of age. Yes. Um, you, you've answered some of the questions I was going to ask, actually. One of the first sports that you went into um, was ice uh, sled ho hockey. Um, and that started you on your journey, really, didn't it? You, you, you've achieved. Uh, when I was reading, I was like, man, he's kept that quiet. I, I didn't quite understand because i just know nathan stevens you know mr javelin um <laughs> and, and you kept that quiet uh you, you do you want to tell people about because you've done every sport i can think of you've had to go i tried, tried my hand at most things yeah but um yeah so so obviously age of 10 years old is when i started playing sledge say a year after my, my accident and recovery and took its place and and yeah, so turned up to the ice rink on a cold Sunday evening, um, and it was probably about nine, ten o'clock at night by the time we got got to the ice rink because that's the only time they could get ice sessions. Um, I jumped on the ice and absolutely fell in love with the sports. Um, full contact, 
it was it was the closest thing I could have got to that rugby environment. Um, and I came off the ice with this massive smile on my face. Uh, the coach at the time, Jamo, he, he turned to my mum and was like, I, "I think he's I think he's too young to play." <laughs> you know, he, our he's ten years old. Our neck, he's like fifteen, sixteen. Is is a six year age gap. And my mum literally just turned to him and was like, I'm sorry, you are not stopping my boy from playing. You know, I don't care what we've got to do if he's got to stay on one side of the ice and, and, and just be on his own. He loves this sport and, he, and he's, and he's going to carry on playing. Um, and that was, that was it. You know, they had to buy a new kit because they didn't have any kit big enough for me because they all had adult <laughs> kits. So um, I was in an adult sledge. I was swamped in this thing. There's, there's, a, there's a picture of me on my Facebook and me in this giant sledge. Um, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And not only was it was it the sport element, but it was that social interaction with individuals with other disabilities, other impairments, um, and the days that I would struggle with 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 my own uh, mental health around my impairment. Just being around that environment really helped me and bring me through it because I, you know, I was with other amputees. I was with individuals with spina bifida, um, individuals with spinal injuries, and. and just to get their take on it. And for someone at such a young age to be in that environment, it allowed me to, to build them coping mechanisms in, in, in from a very, very early age that, that really helped, especially when I was in school and I was getting bullied and you know, I was able to, to, to manage, manage their emotions quite well. Yeah, that's, that's a, uh, you know, a subject which, which we talk about a lot with, with anybody with a disability is the bullying aspect. And, uh, and you're you know, a living legend that shows that you know, it doesn't matter what people say, um, you can achieve you know, your dreams. Now, in 2003, at the age of 15, you managed to get three gold medals, disc, jab, and shot. That's right. Sledge hockey to get in three gold medals. How did, where, where did that come from? Um, so obviously sledge hockey started that journey off for me and it kind of, again, like I said, it ignited that passion for sport for me and I was going to school when I went to comprehensive school. Uh, I, I tried every sport that I possibly could that I was allowed to try. Um, and swimming was one of them big factors for me in school to, to get my fitness up, to, to be integrated in the classroom environment as well, because it was the only real sport that I could really excel at um, compared to my to my peers um, and then from there it kind of I got invited along to um, they now call it the in sport series for disability sport Wales but back then it was um, it was just a multi-sport um, festival then in Newport and as I was there doing table tennis and weightlifting I think on the day um, the legend that is Mr Anthony Hughes spotted me um, who's been my mentor for years and he just said, right, well, come, come with me. And uh, <laughs> so a bit ominous and took me to the corner of the hall and, and handed me a ball and said, right, I want you to throw that against the wall. Um, I was like, right, okay. So I lobbed it against the wall and he thought, right, okay. And just kept on throwing, kept on throwing. And obviously within school, I was playing cricket as well. So I knew how to throw things. I was, before I lost my legs, I was always uh, throwing things things that I shouldn't be throwing and stones at my brother and <laughs> <laughs> other things. But um, so I had a pretty good arm on me and obviously the sledge hockey and the swimming helped build up my shoulders and, and my arm strength. Um, and obviously being in a, a wheelchair pretty much all day every day helped as well. Um, and then he invited me along to a, to a session up in the National, National Indoor Athletic Centre and yeah, spent 18 months throwing dog toys and didn't really have any chance of holding an implement until I got the technique right. And um, a year after, well, 18 months later, so I got entered into my first junior championships and came home with three gold medals and three junior British records. Uh, yeah, I was just about to say, at the age of 16, you broke, you broke the, the three records. Um, yeah, so the, that, that British was the, the British senior records. Um, and that was at my first British senior event. Got two goals and missed out on silver in my discus suit um, to a very, very good um, Jamaican player. Um, so I came home from my first ever British senior champs um, with, uh, with two goals and so learned from three. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, absolutely. From where you came from sledge hockey, then through the throws, and then that was 2003, 2004. 2006, you were in your first um, winter Paralympics. That is... Yeah, so I, 
it, they, they, it kind of shows that you know if you're if you're passionate enough about sport, you, you are able to do multi sports. You know, you're, oh, you're yeah. able to excel in more than one. Um, it's just been able to have that time management and during during two thousand well during two thousand five and two thousand six was I had a choice to make. So there was obviously the Melbourne Commonwealth Games um, yes. and during two thousand six. At the time, I qualified for both. So the plans were going in place to go, right, how do we get from Turin to Melbourne? Uh, and my parents were like, well, what, what, what are you, you, why are you even thinking about doing both? And I said, well, if the opportunity is there, I'm not going to turn it down. Um, but unfortunately, say my classification changed um, late 2015, uh, which resulted in turning me from 56 to a 57 seat thrower. Um, and the Melbourne uh, Commonwealth Games only had spaces for 56. Uh, so that took the decision out of it. So, you know, the fallback was in 2006 Paralympic Games, which was an absolutely amazing experience um, to be there with the team. And again, we, we only just qualified. Um, we, we managed to, to, to take that last, that last slot uh, for the Games. Um, after that, beating Germany in, um, in the World Champs the year before in a, in a tie-out penalty match. Um, which I was the, the lucky winner to score the winning the winning penalty um, to get us to the game. Wow. Um, and then during the games, I was I was the last person to score for for GB to stop us finishing eighth. Um, so we we beat the Italians in in the last match um, in the seventh and eighth playoff. Um, yeah, and say so was in the um, I think it was overtime, um, and say so it came down to. To me, scoring the last goal, which again was absolutely amazing, and it, it was a time of my life that again just just opened doors for me. And you were what eighteen, nineteen at that time? Is that about right? Uh, just uh, two thousand six, yeah, eighteen. Eighteen. So I'm looking at this now, um, and you, you've lost both your legs at the age of nine, and within nine years. You've smashed records. You are in your first Paralympics. This is huge. This is huge yeah. for such a young person. How did you manage to take all that on board? What What was your? Were you just going with the flow? How it was how did fun. You manage fun at that time. There, there was no pressure on me. There was. I was just enjoying it. I was still in school. I was, you know, I was able to take time off school to go to all these amazing competitions and travel the world and still living at home with mum and dad there was no pressure on me at all everybody was you know and I was doing what I loved you know I, it, it was what got give me my life back and to go and do all of that and, and still enjoy yeah okay there was there was difficult times there was, especially in the ice hockey there was times in the changing rooms I didn't want to go out uh, one of the competitions I was throwing up before <laughs> it and the stress and the nerves and the anxiety but as soon as I got out into that rink, got out onto that the, the touring fields, and um, they all just kind of go away, and and you're in that environment that you're thriving, and and, and yeah, you you got to make the most of it. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic and important for for the people who are going to watch this to show that at such an early age, if you're really enjoying something, enjoy that journey, embrace what's what support you get and what what's coming your way, because ultimately if you would never have lost your legs, potentially, you would never have competed at, at that level. Well, you know? Um, no, so no, 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 that, that's, that's it. Um, you know, there's such a small few number of individuals who go to play for Wales or, or play for their country in, in non-disabled sport. And this was my opportunity to, to succeed and push the limits and show everybody, yeah, okay, I may have lost my legs, but, you know, the only, the only disability I have is potentially my mind not allowing me to do that and yeah. putting the boundaries up in front of myself. And, and from a very, very young age, I, I taught myself to, to try and find new ways and adapt it to different sports and different environments, um, even down to playing rugby and football with my friends at school. You know, I, I still got out of my chair, I would sit in the middle of the rugby field, um, you know, rolling around in the mud waiting for them to get close enough to me to tackle them to the floor or playing football and I, I would be in goals brilliant to five a side football until we went up to the full size goals and they realised all they had to do was chip the ball over <laughs> me but um, but yeah so we were just learning to do different things and 
I had a great support network, my brother and my dad and my mum who were always there saying, oh, what about trying to do this way? What about trying to do it that way? And, and again, my friends were, at the time were really supportive and allowed me to, to play the games in my own way without putting any barriers. You know, if I did play football, I'd use my hands and they wouldn't penalise me and call it handball or anything else like that. Or they, they would turn on me. If I touched my leg, then it'd be football. and I'd get penalised for it. But, um, but yeah, so they were just, they were really open and uh, creative and spaces and environments that needed to be me. And I think that's important for coaches to take on boards that look, just because you have a disabled athlete that may walk through your doors, it doesn't mean that they can't take part. We should embrace that. Coaches should embrace that philosophy and, and say, come on, come and have a go. Okay, if we can't do it this way, we can do it that way. And for you, that's huge. Yeah, and, and that's it. And that's, I think, obviously, that's when we work together now. That's what we try to do with the athletes that we work with. It's, it's allowing them to make the choices for them to go, you know, if we want to do an, a skill or, or a sport, just ask the individual, what can you do and what can't you do? Because they'll be open and honest. And if, you, if they say, well, I haven't tried it before, just give them the environment that they can and, and try it in as many different ways that, that they possibly can and for them to find their own way of doing it. Um, and that gives them you know, that, that, that ownership of what they're doing and that pride and enjoyment will come from them experimenting in their own way because they may have not been allowed to do that in previous environments. Because I know it took me a while in school to to tell the teachers to go look if i'm gonna do it mm. let me do it so many times the teachers go you can't do that way. you can't do that. you're gonna hurt yourself I said well if i hurt myself that's my fault you know then that honestly give me a way give me a waiver to sign and i'll sign it for you i'm chuckling because i can actually see you saying that to your teachers uh, knowing you you know as a good friend i can i can see the way you would say it to, to yeah to, to teach so they, they, they were always, you know, me and my, when I was a kid and in my wheelchair, I was going as quick as I can, getting told by my friends with skipping <laughs> ropes, and they were going, Nate, you've got to put your seatbelt on your chair. Yeah. I said, no, because if I fall, then the chair's falling on top of me. <laughs> Seatbelts in wheelchairs are useless. And they were like, well, why do they put them on? I said, I don't know why they put them on, mm. but I'm not wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, oh. and they got fed yeah. up and shouting at me again, and they're like, you know what? That's but that, that is who you are, Nate. That, that is who you are. And, you, and you, you've, you've achieved everything you've achieved through having that um, PMA, that positive mental attitude and, you know, that can-do attitude. Um, 2008. What do you remember about that year? Um, that was my first ever Summer Paralympic Games. That was uh, Beijing 2008. Um, one of the youngest members of the team, well, I wasn't the youngest member of the team at that point, um, but I was one of the only seated throwers to qualify for all three events, uh, shot for javelin and discus. Um, and again, absolutely uh, amazing experience, one of my best performances um, to date in, in, in my javelin event, uh, which was uh, the last on the last one of the competition for me. Um, and yeah, it, it was, it was character building, that one was. Um, obviously, I had my discus and my javelin, no, no, the discus and my shot put beforehand. And uh, shot put, we knew we weren't going to get massively far. We, you know, I, I was small compared to, to the other one. The discus was always just a fun event. Um, the way I threw didn't really allow me to get the most out of, out of the discus at that time. I think I finished 11th in my discus. Um, 11th disc. Eighth shot. Uh, eighth shot. And, and fourth in my jab. Fourth in the jab. Yeah, so the, the night before my jab, um, I was literally on the phone to my coach, just going, I'm not good enough to be here. I'm stressing out. I'm freaking out. I, I'm not, I can't do this. I, I've bombed out of the disc. I had no okay K shot, but, and, and now this is, this is it. Now this is meant to be my event, and what? I, I can't do it. About two o'clock in the morning, this was meant to be up crack a door and to, to, to get ready to go compete and he was just like Nath just just shut up you're, just, you're talking yourself out of it if, if you weren't good enough to be here you wouldn't be here you've put in all the hours you have there's nothing more you can do apart from go out into that field and do what you do best and I was like okay okay that's fine falling with tears and I was 20 year old just like oh, not gonna live um but yeah, as soon as I pushed out into that stadium, once again, it, oh, the, the bird's nest was an incredible, incredible venue to compete in. Couldn't hear yourself think, and, and 
you know, all you could hear was them cheering for the guy next to you. You know, the Chinese, they, they packed the stadium. They were over overfilled. Uh, but, you know, I knew I had, that, I had a job to do. And, but, yeah, so my first three throws didn't go, didn't go to plan. So I qualified, managed to get to the final um, in eighth place or seventh place. Um, and then from that, they, they reversed the order. So they go from eight down to one. Okay. Um, and obviously, I was in seventh place, so I knew I had a lot of work to do to, to get myself up into medals. Um, through a massive PB for me, um, got myself up into third place. I was just like, yes, I got it. Um, but then realized I still had six other competitors to wait for. So it was an agonizing hour wait, just sat oh. there, staring at this, this 90,000 packed stadium of people who was cheering for the guy next to me. And it's like, wait in, wait in. Uh, he didn't get it, so I'm still in third. Fifth person comes, still in third. And then the fourth guy came up, who was Rostislav Polman, Czech guy. Um, and so I was like, right, he's the only guy who can knock me out of my, 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 my bronze medal position. First throw went, foul throw. Second throw went, foul throw. I was like, oh, one more throw. One more throw. And I, I couldn't look until the very last. Year. Well, he threw, and I seen the javelin go in the air, and I was like, Oh, that's, that's, that's a good one. Watching it, watching it, and then it landed. And for me, it should have been a foul throw. It landed tail down, um, but they give it to him. And I was like, oh, now you've got to wait for the scoreboard to pop up. I think it was 20 or 30 centimetres further than my throw. So I was like, no! And <laughs> dropped me back down into fourth place. Um, and yeah, it was... It, it was you had that lump in your throat and it's like, ah, oh. but for me, for my first summer Paralympic Games to finish fourth out of a, a very, very strong field. Um, and then he came up, Rostislav, what you say, he came up to me afterwards and I was like, oh, well done, unlucky. Um, and he said, oh, you know, how old are you? And I said, oh, I'm 20 years of age. And he was like, oh, okay, um, I'm 43. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I've got some time left then. And he was like, yes, yes, you have. Um, and yeah, and then that from there on then was um, yeah me trying to chase Rostislav Polman down to every competition that he went to, so I could keep nipping away at him. Which and, uh, you didn't have to wait that long, really, did you? Not long, because um, two thousand and eleven, the world yeah. champs in New Zealand. That must have been an awesome experience. <laughs> um, lifetime best of thirty nine point one one meters, and That's then right, yeah. In the same year, in the uh, Czech Athletics Open, a world record at 41.37. Now, three years, you've gone chase, 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 chase. That must have been out of this world. It wasn't an easy ride, just put it that way. Um, so after 2009, um, IPC decided to change the seating rules. So in Beijing, where I would sit straight on and really, you know, use a really big flex to hold to gain momentum. Um, after that competition, they said, right, we're going to change the rules. Now you're not allowed to use poles anymore. Um, or if they, you're going to use poles, they're going to have to be rigid ones. Um, we have to think, right, we need to, we need to change the way I throw. We need to completely revamp my technique. Um, so we took away the pole. We took away the frame. We reduced the size of the frame. Um, and I decided to throw my prosthetic on to try and get more use out of, out of the leg that I have to generate momentum. And that took a good few years to, to develop and, and, and refine. But in 2010, um, I ruptured, well, I basically ripped my shoulder apart. Um, and in February 2010, so I had to have um, a labor repair on my shoulder, labor and repair. Um, and... Uh, shoulder decompression and also clean out my bicep and my tricep ligaments that got torn in late 2000, 2009. So all of 2010 I was in rehab um, and it wasn't until the August that year that I was able to actually throw again. So we had two competitions left before the deadline for qualification of the world champs happened and in my first competition after doing all my rehab and then learning this new technique um, Again, that's when I threw my PB and qualified for, for the World Champs. Um, but then when we were out in the World Champs, I didn't. I threw about 
three or four times. Um, the rest of the time was loads and loads of visualization stuff, sitting in front of the mirror, just going through technical aspects of my flow. Um, and the only one time that I did pick up a job, I had an absolutely awful session. Um, <laughs> literally, I uh, threw a massive paddy and a tantrum, got out to my frame, and what helped me with my new technique was I, I could throw from my day chair. Um, so I literally just sat in the rain for about another hour, two hours, just floating out jabs, nothing too serious, just trying to get that technique ingrained into my head. Um, and then through an absolute blinder of a throw, didn't measure it, but I knew it was fine. I thought, right, that's me done, I'm ready. And then waited then until the competition. Um, yeah, so it, it, it was tense all time, New Zealand. Say, as much as I loved it, it was, I kind of had to put in place all them um, strategies that I had for Beijing where, you know, you, you've got to be patient and you've got to throw and make sure that you do the right one. Um, but this time, say, the, the competition was a little bit different. I finished in second place this time rather than seventh. And by the time I was going in for my second round of throw, there was only one more place that I could jump and I was into goals. Um, and again, I did it on my last throw, which was, um, which was really, yeah, it, it, it was that when that relief and that weight gets lifted off your shoulders, it's like, finally, all the work, all the stresses that you put yourself through the year before with rehab and not knowing if you were ever going to make the games again, if you were ever going to throw again. Um, yeah, it, it was a very, very emotional competition that was, and one that's going to stick with me for, uh, for the rest of my life. And, Medal hanging up, hanging up on my ceiling up there. So you can see it. That one, that one right in the middle. Pride of place. It's um, yeah. It's uh, it's there to remind me every day that it's uh, you know, you, you can you may have some really tough battles, but as long as you stick at it, you can. Uh... And I think that's really important about your journey. Full stop. Is that you carried on. You never give up. I mean, in 12 months, you've gone from basically ripping your shoulder to bits, uh, having surgery, to, to you know, the, the best that you can be. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, Amazing. later on that year, to say breaking the world record, that, that was, you know, winning the world champs is great. But to say that you're, you are the furthest thrower in the world in your category was was even greater for me to, to say that yeah i am world record holder at this present moment in time i am truly the best in the world because you know it, you can win a competition on your worst throw ever you know it doesn't doesn't really cement to you as as a world champion or the world's best but for me bringing bringing home that title and having that certificate saying you're world record holder was like yeah that's uh that's awesome um, this book of records then, that's that's cool Dave. guinness book of records yeah yeah exactly yeah, that's well, right. My name will be in there for, for history. At that's some right. Point. That's right. And, and you as a person, you know, you've created history, which is uh, especially for athletes in Wales. Um, 2012, you were selected as an ambassador for the British team. Um, yes. Can you tell us. Um, yeah, so it, again, <laughs> not the best of, um, of the run-ups for, uh, for, for major games for 2012. Um, after I broke the world records, knowing that next year was a home Olymp home Paralympic Games and you want to try and be at the top of your game, jumped back into training a little bit too soon. Um, hadn't fully rested and kind of neglected my warm-up and my routine that I used to go through to, to make sure my shoulders were all good and ended up tearing my labrum again um, late 2011. Um, so again, same process. This time I had uh, less of a recovery. So January 2012. I actually went in for uh, for another labour and repair, um, but again, still trying to do my rehab and and become a, I became a BT ambassador, um, which again with with the main sponsors for the game. So having to put a smile on on everything that I did to go, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be fine. But in the back of my head, thinking I haven't thrown yet, I haven't thrown yet, I'm still in rehab. Um, is it gonna go well? And so yeah, again, it was an, <laughs> another bumpy ride going into going into 2012. But um, the year leading up to it was amazing. Um, regardless of my injury and, and being in rehab, just the publicity around para sport and, and just the, the society's knowledge and understanding around what 
we go through as athletes, um, especially in para sport, having to overcome our disabilities as well as training implications. Um, yeah, it, it put it put para sport on the map for me. Um, that, that lead up. Yeah, I was going to say it. I, I think that the London um, Olympics and Paralympics definitely um, opened people's eyes in this country to um, uh, disabled sport. Uh, and yeah, having massive. you uh, as an ambassador, especially for Wales, was was fantastic. Um, okay, it wasn't your best um, competition, no. But the experience. Uh, and what it's done for the sport in in Wales and the UK is w was massive. Yeah, in the end of the day, sport is sport. You're going to have some competitions that go well, and others that go absolutely out the window. Uh, and unfortunately, London 2012 was was one of them for me. Um, obviously, just to get there was an achievement in itself, having the rehab and the surgery that that, that same year. So. That in itself was, was a huge achievement for me, and it took me a, it took me a while to realise that. It took me a good few months after, probably a year, two years after the end of 2012, um, to realise that I still got there. You know, I can still say that I've competed in a home games, where you know not many athletes can, um, and it was one of them times for me that um, it was either going to make me or break me. Um, whether that be within sport or life or, or after that. Um, so I'll just go briefly into, into what happened in London 2012, obviously. Um, due to the new rule changes that happened back in uh, 2010 that we had to change my technique for, the officials were still getting used to the new rules um, and they mixed our categories. So I wasn't just competing in the classification of 57s, we were also competing in um, a class of 58 as well, so that they combined the, the two groupings. The difficulty with that in seed throws was there was one set of rules for the 58s and another set of rules for the 57s. Um, and unfortunately, because I threw with a prosthetic on, they thought that I had a leg, um, which then would have put me in a 58 classification. Um, but they then disqualified my throws because when I throw, my back foot, like a seesaw, kind of just lifted off the floor to stop my body weight from falling at the front of the frame. And because I didn't have anything to strap my left leg down because I haven't got one. So they said, no, no, you've got, to keep your, you've got to keep your foot on the floor. I was like, I don't. I'm 57, not 58. Like, no, 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 I know the rules. And I was like, right, okay. So again, through again, again, same happens. Leg lifted up, red flag. And by that point, my head had absolutely gone. Um, and my last throw, I just literally was a warm-up throw um, just to try and get a throw in. And unfortunately, it didn't, it didn't qualify me for the, for the top eight to get into the final. Um, but again, I challenged um, the official and said, look, you, know, the, you should have a rule book on you so I can show you. And after, after my throw, the official actually disappeared into the back room. Um, and then the head official came out and was like, Nate, we're, we're really sorry. Um, the official got the rule wrong. Um, she should never have fouled your throws. They did. They asked if I wanted to have another, another round of throws. But my motivation and, and as everything had hit rock bottom. So even if I did have another round of three, they probably wouldn't have been any better. So I would have been throwing frustrated and angry. And, and for me, that was never a good way to throw. Um, yeah, and, and so that, well, that was London 2012 uh, it, on the competition side um, and left the village that night. Um, didn't stick around for closing ceremony. Uh, didn't stick around just to see anybody else. I, I just was not in, in the right mindset. And came home and was really contemplating stopping, stopping everything altogether. Um, because... As I said, when I first got into the sport, it was for the enjoyment and the love of it. Um, and that night, I lost all respect and, and love for the sport that, that had, had got me so far in life. Um, but again, like I said, it took me a, a good few years to realise, well, actually, you know, you still got there. You, it was still a massive achievement to get there, regardless of, of decisions made. That's sport, that's life. That's, you know, you know you're watching World Cups and... and Rugby World Cups and decisions get taken out of out of the players' hands sometimes, and, and that's part and part of sport. You know, either you've got the good side and you've got the rough side. Now my head's spinning now because you made that decision 
you could have had your three throws. Now, what a big decision. You know, what that tells me and tells other athletes that it is okay to say no. It is okay to have those feelings and yeah. to know when things aren't right. And I think that's really important and a massive decision to make as, you know, as an athlete. Yeah, I, at the end of the day, whenever I throw, I needed to be as relaxed as possible um, and, and have that enjoyment and, and be as flexible and fluid as I possibly could to throw. And I would have gone into them free throws angry. Um, I probably would have said or done something that probably wouldn't have put me in a good light. So obviously I still had to deal with all the media afterwards um, and trying to deal with the media with, with your emotions flying high. Um, I, had to, I had to compose myself. And even if I had my three throws, it probably would have made me even more angry and even more bitter. Um, so I just had to deal with, deal with the media there and then and hold back the tears because I was at say that I was distraught, um, managed to hold them back when going to the mix zone, um, which is where all the cameras and the media are. Um, says, unfortunately, it didn't go my way today. Um, and as soon as I got at the mix zone and see my family, that's it. Came crumbling down and, um, and yeah, so they left the village that night, like I said. And that. But, but in many ways, 2012 was another amazing year for you because yeah. you got married. Um, well, I was with my, so I got married in 2013. Um, 2013, so. Yeah, so the year after, so it was, it was that time of, of uncertainty for me in 2013, uh, 2013, whether or not I was going to continue with sport uh, or whether or not um, I, I would stop. And I, I'd been with, with, with my wife um, for two two years at that point, and she kind of gone through every emotion with me. She was there when I was world champion, and she was there when I was at my rock bottom after in 2012. Um, and she was my rock. She was she was beside me all the way, and that's when I realised this is this is the girl I need to marry. Um, so I proposed it in May. Uh, Sorry, I've not posed in. in get, get it right now, Ness. You'll be in trouble. Oh, now, you, now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> when did I propose? <laughs> no, proposed in. Oh, sorry, proposed in 2012. Uh, proposed in May 2012. Um, um, again, because yeah, she she'd been there, but um, yeah, I managed to set a date, and it, it it was the highlight for my year for 2013. Then was was marrying my wife. Um, yeah, and even even though we we'd been through uh, an extremely difficult time, the end of 2012, um, at least we had something to look forward to. Um, and I was still still training, still doing bits and bobs, um, but uh, it wasn't a massive priority for me at that at that stage. I had to kind of get my my life in order rather than, than sport. And yeah, I had a had a magical wedding in, in the Celtic Manor in in, our, um, in August 2013. And um, yeah, it was. An amazing day and, and again that was a challenge in itself because the one thing that um, I guess I could give my wife that no one else could was our first dance um, and so yeah I, I put on well for, for months leading up to the wedding um, my, I was practicing our, our dance in our living room with my prosthetic leg on and um, yeah just walked walked out so didn't have my both legs prosthetics on for, for all of the day so I was on my one prosthetic like I usually am and uh, for, our, for our first wedding dance I snuck off into a back room to, to put my leg on um, and then walked out for the first time ever walked out hand in hand with, with no crutches uh, with my wife on the dance floor and we took our first dance and yeah everybody was in floods of tears myself included and <laughs> I was dancing for the first time with my wife on our wedding day so Amazing, amazing. What, um, Nathan Stevens, uh, you now have a full-time job with Disability Sport Wales. I have to ask the question, which I haven't asked you. Have you got your eyes set on something else in the future? Um, I am happy to say no. <laughs> you, you, you haven't still got that urge to compete in something? No, I think after London 2012, um, and after I retired from athletics in 2014, 
I kind of got not pushed out of the sport, but things got made extremely difficult for me to compete at the best of my ability um, with new rule changes, new seating positions to try and level up the playing field. Um, 2014, I, I chose to step away from competing, um, but it wasn't how I would have liked to have, to have stopped. I would have liked to finish on a high and win more medals and get my world record back. But unfortunately, with, with the new way that the rules panned out, it was really extremely difficult for me to do that. So when I started work in 2015 uh, with Disability Sport Wales, there was still that, that urge to um, still, still have got that fulfillment of, of sport that I wanted to get from it. Um, and I watched 2016. Um, Paralympic Games in, in Gold Coast, uh, sorry, in Rio, was glad that I wasn't doing athletics, uh, but still had that urge to, I'm not ready to retire yet. You know, I'm not ready to, to give up on my sporting dreams. And there was one competition that I hadn't done yet, um, and that was Commonwealth Games, because uh, we narrowly, narrowly missed out on, on Melbourne due to classification changes. And luckily fell upon, uh, I was doing some work with uh, Welsh weightlifting at the time to, to make them more inclusive and, and doing some work on their, on their para pathway program. And I was going through some of, the, some of the courses with them and they turned around to me and was like, uh, so Nath, are you, uh, you doing any sports at the minute? And I'm like, no, not at the minute. And they're like, want to give powerlifting a go? I was like, well, I've done bench press before. It was a staple part of my, <laughs> of my gym routine. So, um, started to, to, to dabble in that didn't think anything was going to come from it because obviously I was working full time and knew that the commitment needed to, to be successful at a sport was you know you had to put your heart and soul into it and I was loving what I was doing with the pathway stuff with disability sport Wales and trying to fit it in between traveling and work was, was tough um, but they took me away to a competition in, in Hungary uh, and went okay Went, went, went well for, for what I thought and didn't realise they actually put me in the running to, to compete at the Commonwealth Games. <laughs> I think they had that plan in their head that they knew what I was lifting. And, um, yeah, and yeah, got selection for, for Gold Coast and had to have that conversation with my wife to go, <laughs> do you know what I said? I'd stopped travelling for, for sport and, and all that. And she was like, yeah. Um, do you mind if I go away for a month to, to Australia? <laughs> And she was like, no, go for it. End of the day, so you need it. You need closure. Um, you need sport in your life to keep you happy. Um, and she was fully supportive of me going out um, and going to Gold Coast. Okay, I was out there for my 30th birthday as well, which was <laughs> a fantastic trip. But that was probably the, <laughs> the most annoyed my wife had been not spending one of my birthdays because it was one of my big wins. Um, but yeah, uh, and again, it, it was a tremendous experience. First time I'd ever actually competed in a true Welsh rest, um, but for any of my sports. So that was a major, major achievement in itself. And I went out there and I pushed personal best lift. And that's all I could have asked for. Um, you know, the guys I beat was competing against, they'd been, this was their chosen sport. You know, they'd been competing at it for years and years and years. And then this this wannabe powerlifter come in from only doing 18 months of training um, to, to compete on their stage. Um, I didn't want to do them any disrespect. Um, I know what it's like to be a sportsman and have someone who rocks up to your sport thinking that they can do it. Um, and I just went out there knowing I just wanted to, to do myself justice, do myself proud and push the personal best lift, came home happy and finished dead last. Well, no, I didn't finish dead last because Someone um, fouled out on all their throws, uh, all, their, all their lifts. So I didn't finish last, which was amazing. Um, but yeah, and... The experience. Coast, the experience, uh, Nate. You, that it Welsh fest, it, it's... Incredible. It was, yeah, yeah one of them proud, the proud, proudest moments of my life that was competing for Wales. Um, and something I never, uh, something I'd never thought I'd be able to do. Because, um, again, athletics didn't give me the opportunity to do it. Um, but I, I found a sport that did, and I wanted to, to continue with it. I really did. I didn't want to just be a one-trip pony and take one competition. Um, but when I came home for, from 
Gold Coast. Um, work got really busy and I wanted to put everything I had in, in, into work and, and develop the environments that can allow individuals like myself who, who are, you know, with disabilities and impairments to thrive. Um, and, that, and that's obviously the work that I'm doing with yourself now to try and make sure that everybody can have access to the, the same environments and, and same opportunities that I had growing up. Definitely. Um, I hope that most of the athletes that we work with or watch this video, your journey is, is one of a roller coaster, which, which a lot of journeys of, of elite athletes are. What advice would you give to any of those athletes that are beginning on their journey and there are going to be tough times ahead? What is that one piece of advice you would give to them um, for their journey? Um, it's probably just be patient. Um, understand that it, it isn't a straight road. You know, there's going to be curves, there's going to be dips, there's going to be peaks, there's going to be troughs, and you've got to take the good with the bads. Um, and I'm telling you now, there, there's going to be a lot more bad than there is good. But the one good opportunity that comes your way will severely out and surpass the negatives um, and continue to enjoy it no matter what. Um, when it gets to the stage that you're not enjoying it anymore and you've lost the love for it, that's when you need to, to have that conversation with yourself to, to step away. Um, and that's what I did. And I, I wouldn't change my decision because um, it allowed me to focus on other aspects of my life that I probably wouldn't have done if I was still focusing on, on, on the sports. Um, and yeah, and, and it's to find a sport that you enjoy. Find the sport that you don't mind going out in the rain to do find a sport that you don't mind putting all the hours in find a sport that you know that you're willing to sacrifice birthdays holidays trips away with your friends to do um and that's what i did um you know i took javelin to the beaches i took javelin for holiday i missed birthdays every year because we were always away warm weather training or in training camps um, but I didn't mind because I was ultimately doing something that I loved and enjoyed. That's an amazing piece of advice because one of the things that I've learned from yourself and, and the rest of the guys at Disability Sport Wales is I'm a basketball coach. You know, I love and, and, and have lived basketball. But the advice I give to, to young people now is, look, I'm not here to teach you basketball. You find what you enjoy. Keep trying until you can find that sport that's right for you. And I th with Disability Sport Wales, we've got an amazing platform in place and people that you can talk to, you know, you have to have that, that network in place that you can talk to somebody if you don't think something is right or if you want to make that change. And Disability, Disability Sport Wales provides that. Yeah, and it's something that we're, we're putting a lot of effort into now is to, is to try and find youngsters at that very early age to give them the skills and confidence and ability to do that. Um, give them platforms that they can try as many different sports that weren't, avail weren't available um, to them previously and, and find the sport that they enjoy the most. You know, it, it could be wheelchair dance, it could be wheelchair rugby, um, it could be wheelchair basketball, it could be triathlon, taekwondo or para canoe. You know, there are so many opportunities out there now and we've slowly started to build that platform for you to try them all. Um, and we've got some fantastic coaches to help you along the way. Lee, you being one of them. Um, and say the experiences that we all have together will hopefully bring through the next generation of future Paralympians. And, and not only that, just good human beings and individuals. Because um, not everybody will make it to the Paralympics. But as long as we can help the individuals to succeed in one aspect of their life, for me, that's a success. Um, and it if it allows that child to, to be a little bit more confident when they're out in the street or a little bit more confident while they're in the playground, um, then we're, we're winning. Um, Nathan, you are a true inspiration for all the young people that are out there and 100% an ambassador for sport in general. I want to thank you for the last 45, 50 minutes um, because it's opened, again, my eyes, as it always does when I speak to you. But not only that, this message can go across to the, to the young athletes. So I just want to say a big thank you for myself and uh, for, for everybody who's going to watch this video. So uh, thank you. Yeah, stay, 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 stay on the line, Nathan. Um, no, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Lee. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you.